Listen up. On March 3rd, 2019, Mike led a seminar entitled How to Avoid All the Stupid Mistakes I Made on the Way to Game Design Success at the Gamma Trade Show. We know a lot of RTG fans are also interested in game design, so we're presenting the audio of Mike's seminar as a special episode of Listen Up. We do apologize for the audio quality. The session was recorded with a phone, so it's not as good as it could be, especially when it comes to audience questions. But still, you should get a lot of good information out of this, so thank you and enjoy. Does anyone here uh, have an idea or not have an idea who I am and the background? Should I explain my kind of life up here talking to you guys? You should. Okay. Um, one of my, my name is Mike Monson. I run a company called RTL Sorting, Sorting Games, which was supposed to be called RTG, but nobody ever cares or uses the acronym. Um, we do a game called Cyberpunk, which is what most people know us for. We also do Nexon. Genius from Outer Space, Castle Falkenstein, uh, now The Witcher, and the list kind of goes on and on, kind of rambles. I've been in business for 35 years. Um, and I've actually managed to make a living doing it. Uh, one of the reasons also, one of the things I discuss, which is branching out, because I've also worked in video games. And in fact, I started in video games many, many, many years ago on Apple IIEs at a company called California Pacific. Um, kind of give you an idea, it was back when uh, Robert, uh, Richard Gary, correction, Richard Gary was 17 or 18, I was like 20, and we were both a bunch of young, pimply punks in the video game business. And we had a stylish, cool, and crazy boss who was so stylish, cool, and crazy that eventually drove us into bankruptcy. So that's the first lesson. Okay. Um, I told me the first. The first lesson is going to be actually the strangest and silliest one I'm going to give you, okay? And that is, get a wine shirt. <laughs> okay. You notice I have a stylish wine shirt. Um, this isn't a joke. It actually symbolizes something, and it's an important thing to remember in this business. When I came into it many, many, many years ago, I remember Jeff Grubb saying at one point, you need to get a wine shirt if you're a designer. And I said, oh, really? I didn't know at the time that TSR crew, because Jeff was one of the original TSR, second generation TSR crew, that Hawaiian shirts, particularly worn on Fridays, were a symbol something that Gary Gygax used to do many, many years ago as well. I was wondering why is Gary wearing a Hawaiian shirt? That's why. He had started a concept. And part of that concept was that there's a tradition. There's traditions of things we do as designers, there's traditions of things that people know, have discussed, and the Hawaiian shirt in some weird way symbolizes an acknowledgement of that, an acknowledgement of membership. So it's sort of like, you know, having a secret code word there, right? And designers of all different kinds of companies will show up wearing their Hawaiian shirts, and you know, as a designer, and to God, that guy has no taste. <laughs> Uh, I actually went out especially bought this once so it would match our company's colors. But then red and black is not that hard to actually match up, especially if you're bleeding on it. Um, but the point is this, as part of that membership, the first thing to remember is you have allies, you have friends, you have people who are willing to teach you. They are people who will come out of the woodwork and say, do this, don't do that, so that you don't have to discover the stupid mistake that they discovered two, three, four, five, ten years ago. So the first and most important thing is don't do it alone, all right? If you do that, you're going to make all those same mistakes. And as you make those mistakes, they will cost you money, time, people, and a lot of hair and sleep. So remember that the people out there who are also wearing the Hawaiian shirts, will help you. They will come unasked. I remember uh, Artel Soria, the name. I was warned by Warren Spector, who was at that point working for Steve Jackson. Mike, whatever you do, never name your company after yourself. And I kind of looked at all the Steve. But, but um, I chose not to name it myself. Well, there's a good reason for that as well, which was, that your company may change hands. Your lead designers may not be you. 
your brand should be set up in a way where it isn't necessarily tied to the founder of the company or the name on the letterhead. Because your best talent and best people might be coming from a different place than the person whose name is on the letterhead. So you want to make your company open to a lot of different opportunities and ideas. Which is why, weirdly enough, you know, we named ours after essentially a guy who was an investor who was never, ever going to come to a game convention. You know, he, he didn't care. He was a race farmer looking for a way to, to lose money. And we screwed up because the first year he made money and we were subchapter S at that point. He said, you were supposed to lose money. I said, uh, so you were supposed to make a lot of money. Uh, you made a lot of money, you cost me something. For those of you who don't know, subchapter S is a shared liability where if you take a hit or a loss, the company members, people who put money into it, end up taking out of their personal taxes. That's a useful thing to know. It may or may not exist, but it's a way to bring people in to help support you. In those days, there was no Kickstarter. There's a way to get that money seated in. Go to somebody who has more money than they know what to do with, who's looking for a tax loss, and go talk to them because they actually don't want you to crash. <laughs> and the trick is crash? No. Win? A little less than we did. <laughs> okay. So, Hawaiian shirts, which means what? You're one of us. Yeah, I like the way he says that. You're one of us, and you're also, you have access to the group memory out there. Don't forget that, okay? If you do, you will do the same things over and over again. Um, this is a new seminar, but in the past I've done seminars here on things like how much am I supposed to spend to do my board game? And then, bam, I look at some poor guy who's got a board game, and he goes, yeah, it's really great. I go, there's a lot of components there. Okay, how much does this cost you? Ah, uh, gee, uh, well, it's, it, it's about $40 of components. <laughs> Crash. I go, how much are you selling? Well, I figure I get $55. And I'm going, <laughs> you did keep in mind if you get any size, you have distribution, shipping, and all the other things. And they would go, what? And I go, okay, let's sit down with the Okay, which leads to a second, or actually this will be a third thing. I'm moving too fast, my meandering around around too much. Great, good. All right, there's, there's a man waiting back to the sign telling me, want to shut up. Okay, third thing. You never have a project that you love so much that you're not willing to take out and shoot. As designers, we're not the best judges of which of our children should go on and stand in the light. We love them all. There are kids. There is literally, and my wife back there's a business manager can tell you, there's literally a huge file cabinet of ideas and concepts I tossed away and I didn't do. They cost too much. They weren't the right time. Okay? They had other inherent problems. Um, so an important thing when you look at your project the thing, you know, the brainchild you want to bring to market. As a designer, you have to know, is this going to be a smart project? Okay. So smart project. A smart project, for one thing, you need to understand if somebody's going to buy it. Okay. Understand that. Do the research to find out whether anyone's even interested in this. Now, people say, well, what do you do for research? Um, there's a lot of things, but one of the best things to do when you have the internet to help you now is you go out into the market and you just listen and watch. Okay? So, you know, I, I'm fain to tell a story, of, particularly back oh, about 10, 15 years ago, I would drag people in my office in the design crew and we go to Toys R Us. I don't know what I'm do now, but we used to go to Toys R Us. And the reason was, I could be walking to Toys R Us and I would be looking at all of these toys that were up aisle, down aisle, and I would look at the kids playing. 
I would look at the kids who would go, oh man, look at that Jamaican. Or, yeah, I like this thing because of this. I would look at things and go, oh, this isn't my exact age market, but hmm, they're interested in this, and because there's a thing in the zeitgeist. Does everybody have an idea what zeitgeist is? Anybody lost on that one? Anybody here not speak German? <laughs> Philosophy? Okay, zeitgeist in a thumbnail way to describe it is basically the, the mood or the feeling of the times. You know, what is going to ghost of the times? What, you know, what is behind this? So, give you a case in point, giant robots. We, so, I found some Japanese giant robot stuff, and I went, hmm, this would make kind of an interesting game. Hmm, what do I do with this? And I was looking for Japanese stuff, but when I went out, I noticed that people were starting to get really interested in it. And then about the time when I got seriously thinking about doing Vecton, people started watching Ultron. Okay, so I went, hmm. I went, Japanese robots, Ultron, it's not translated yet, but it's getting translated. And oh wait, they're watching Space Battle for Giamato. And they're looking at all these old, old anime. And kids are now going, they're flying their action figures, going, <laughs> lasers. Okay, and I went, hmm. There's a lot going on here that I can unpack. There's interest. There's a wide enough market. There's support behind that market, i.e., I don't have to go, what is this? And do you go to Chat Robot? What the hell are you talking about? Chat Robot. No, I can go, hey, it's like Ultron. Oh, I got that blazing sword. I got those in kill robots. Yeah, I broke it. Before you left, the members come back. My, my daughter and her friends. Who are grown adults now, I have no idea what they're doing for work. Um, they are back in the old time. Okay, so remember things don't die. Okay, that is knowing the site, guys. So you first find out are there people out there who want your product? You may, I remember somebody coming to me when I was uh, president of this esteemed organization many, many years ago. And Leslie came to me during a game, she said, I have a scheme on goats. And I went, oh, okay, and I try to give her some advice on goats. But now, that would be a dumb move because goats have a popular joke factor in there. The zeitgeist has pitched up things like Goat Simulator. How many people saw Goat Simulator? You know, <laughs> bounce the goat off the ceiling, bounce the goat off the traffic light, you know, okay. So suddenly goats are interesting, cool, and your audience market has just begun to happen with some tweaking she might make goat simulator work. Okay. So know that you have a market. Don't make a mistake that a lot of times, you know, I would make up, I just love this game. Chimney sweets. No, not gonna work. Okay, this is particularly dangerous in board games because I do RPGs for the most part. I've done board games. I've done video games, I've done you know, card games, that kind of stuff. But what I learned with the elements of board games leads to the next lesson. What will it take, really look at what will it take to implement this design? What do I really need to have to make this happen? Okay. You do not start by going, I need 500 figures, each individually carved. Uh, three of them will be designed by some of the best figure designers in the world. And no, I have no background in this. I don't know anybody in Hong Kong. And I'm going to just build this game. It's got lots of components. This way lies madness. I see too many people do this. I have been guilty of it occasionally. And then the woman in the back laughs and says, Oh, no, you don't either. That's why I'm a business manager. When I'm mortgaging a house, so you can have 200 figures in the box. Okay, good. So, you have your dream, you've been willing to take your dream and go, hmm, yeah, maybe there's someone out here who wants this game. But I'm gonna have you know, 200 figures in it, and I'm gonna have this in the box, and have that box. Your game just got too expensive to do, and that's a mistake that I have been guilty of, and other people have been guilty of, many other people have been guilty of. So one of the things you want to do is look, how can I do this cheaply? 
not just because I'm cheap, but there's that fine line between, yeah, this really looks cheap, and this really is expensive, but no one's gonna spend $400 for it, okay? One of the things I recommend, I used to teach video game design uh, in college. Uh, and one of the things I remember, my students had in projects, okay, so you're going to make a board game. Go out. I remember I, I found one poor guy and he spent like $200 on dice. And he was on this multiple dice game in a game store. He's buying these really expensive, really nice marble dice and going, Rob, why are you doing that? And he's going, Well, I've got to have it look good because of this. And going, No, Rob, right now, you're going to have to make this actually work and you're going to pay for it. And then when you do this, I want you to think down the line, whatever you charge is going to be what they're probably willing to pay you, and you're maybe going to lose half of that if you put it in distribution. You're probably going to lose more than half. Okay, so when you think of it, it's going to be $59.99, no, it's going to be half that kids, at least. Remember that, because then, that other half, you get to eat. So I went back and said, okay, we're going to go over the really cheap dice, and we're going to look at how we implement that, okay? We're gonna ask questions, like you have this army thing over here that you wanna do. What do you need to represent your army? Do you have to go buy these individual figures, which you're not gonna be able to do when you bring this into production? Or can something else represent that? Because you've got 50 figures, maybe you could be using car stands, you could be using chits, you be using, you know, if you're going to be stacking them, you could be using some other format. So, I bought the cost of this game, which was somewhere up around two hundred dollars. I managed to get that down to about twenty, which still was probably too expensive because theoretically, just to make back this twenty, he had to sell it at probably forty or fifty. Okay, and he had to count it in things like the box, the board, the cards, all the figures, the spinner. You know, the only thing this guy's game was missing in his head was like, you know, a digital input that, you know, like let down the internet somewhere and said, turn the beer. Yeah. So, the lesson that is, don't fall in love with it and don't overspend on it. Look at your design. What does every single piece of your design mean to the person who will use this game? They may look at the figures and go, wow. But in the end, what they need to know is, do I have enough people in this army to beat the other guys in the other army? Okay, um, I recommend, and I did this with my students, go to Game Crafters, cruise through their catalog, and say, gee, what can I steal from this that I can use? <laughs> in, in a weird moment, I actually ended up, I worked on a game called uh, Buck Rogers Toy by C, and uh, with Jeff Grubb and a bunch of other people at TSR. And I remember, like 10 years later after we'd done this game, it was on aftermarket, they were dumping all the figures. And I went, oh, hmm, I need armies here. And they're selling them for like 400 dice for a $10 bag. So, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed, it's my own game. <laughs> Shut up, just put it in the box. You know? So seriously, what I looked at then was this represents soldiers, I found soldiers. I found that at Game Crafters. Okay. Look at resources so that you don't spend yourself for a wolf. I'm moving too fast, everybody with me so far. No one's throwing anything, so I guess we're good. We good? Okay. This is Jay, our social media guy. He's here to make sure I'm saying anything really stupid. Okay. So, you don't love it, but you like it. You're willing to go triage it. Uh, you build it, build it simple, so that you know that the basic principles work. Okay, um, I remember Miyamoto said in some comments I went to that, you know, every Mario game started off with gameplay, they worked out a dumb way to do gameplay, and they went all the way through gameplay, and beat the living daylights out of it, and only then to decide what was it Mario was really doing. So before it was, you know, okay, Mario Sunshine, got a mechanic where he's where you could fly around and squirt things. Squirt guns are cool. I can do that. And then what do I do with that? 
so that I have squirt guns, or in this case, a giant jetpack of water, to do something in this world, okay? So look at your application and find out how inexpensively and simply you can do that. Two reasons. Uh, one, it tells you whether your design is leaning on the toys that are in it, or your design is just a solid, cool, fun thing to do. And you want to know that. Okay? You will not be there saying, oh man, you've got to try this. This is the best game ever. Your game will be sitting alone in a box on a shelf, or it will be sitting there with it spied out, and no one can see the fancy cover that you bought. And they're going to have to go by and see what you've got. It will stand and fall. So, okay. So, Hawaiian shirts. Gather yeah, information. Go do your recons. Kill your ugliest children. <laughs> Be willing to do that. Like I said, there, there's a pilot captain who did stuff that I will do. I'm going to circle back to that for a moment because of. Uh, that ties back to Zeitgeist. Um, sometimes you put in a bottle cabinet and you never see it again. Sometimes you put in a bottle cabinet and then 10 years later something comes up in the Zeitgeist and you go, hmm, I could sell this now. So, you know, like years and years and years ago, I wrote a game as a joke called Surf and Destroy, the game of combat surfing. Okay. And at the time, you know, surfing was this mystical, you know, cool thing. You know, I was a surfer, you know. And I thought, yeah, I'll do this, except combat surfing. And my market would have been at that point surfers. Surfing wasn't as cool as it was back during the days of Gidget. I was during the trout when it was like Rip Curl, but only among a certain number of us, right? But now, because there are weird competitive types of games, where competition and combat are part of the model, you can look at it and say, hmm, yeah, it's serving, but what I really have here is a game where two or more people are fighting for control of the wave using stupid things, okay? So that leads to the other thing, the next thing, mistakes you don't make. Know what the heart of your game actually is. Got to sell it, you know. Know the heart of the game. Boy, try to influence. Whatever. Um, the upshot is this. Like I said, my daughter's like heavy into this stuff. Anyway, know the heart of your game. Know what it is. Uh, Jordan Weissman of FASA once taught me something, which he said 16 word test. He said, if you could define it 16 words or less, what you do in your game why it's cool, you know what your game is about. Knowing what your game is about, what your design is about, will help you structure it. It will help you look at what parts do I need and what don't I need. It will help you look at whether or not somebody has done this before, whether or not it did well or badly, and if so, why. And it will also tell you a great deal about what is extraneous. You know, if you can't get it down to 16 words, then you probably have too many things happening in your game. And generally what I call for is for my journalistic training back in the dark ages when I worked in underground newspapers, uh, who, what, where, when, and why, and how. How is the part where you look at the counters and things like that? But Who's going to play it? You know, what are they going to do? When are they going to do this thing? You know, is this going to be uh, only at conventions? Is this going to be sitting around at home with their friends? Is this going to be, you know, a social event? Okay. Where? When? Why? Why are they going to do this? So, you know, that's why is it fun? Why am I having a good time with it? So all of this kind of piles together. And there are things that I've learned the hard way, but because of the Hawaiian shirt lesson, I haven't had to take as many hits on that. Okay? I've been not just lucky, but I've had people who went, like, that's a damn fool idea. Don't do that. Or that's really too expensive. 
And so if it was a stupid idea, I went back and I said, hmm, does this go in the enormous file cabinet of dead games? Does it wait in the holding file of dead games? Uh, or do I do my homework or my research? I also would look at it and go, if this is so expensive, what do I do in this game and how do I knock my costs down? And this goes for role-playing games as well. Because remember that for every set of non-components, you just have your book, right? You have the cost of that. Do you print color? Do you print black and white? Do you print hardbound? Do you print large format, small format, A4? You know, and then there's going to be all the stuff that your players may want. Are you going to do figures? Are you going to do special dice? Are you going to do maps? Are you going to do referee screens? Are you going to do cards? For example, I did Castle Falkenstein with a very weird and revolutionary using cards model. And originally I was going to design especially cards. I said, this will cost a billion dollars. Just the color, good cards, that sort of thing. Otherwise it will look really cheap. So I went and redesigned it so that it used standard playing cards because everybody can get playing cards. And now that it had a particular cachet because players could bring their own cards to the tables. So they go, I didn't have my steampunk deck here, but we'll have my cyberpunk deck. Whatever. You went up. There are steampunk and cyberpunk decks out there. I have them. I'm embarrassed to admit that. Okay. The upshot is looking not just at the components and you know, how things play together, but also where everything fits. What you're building is entertaining, okay. So that leads to another thing which I have walked into. Um, that is don't let the things you do love overshadow the purpose of your game. Uh, I have a cautionary tale. I did a game called Cyberpunk V3, uh, which was basically trying to read the market and aiming our very popular Cyberpunk line to cover transhumanism. And because I happen to collect and love G.I. Joes and see a lot of really cool G.I. Joe uh, simulating live action art out there, I thought, well, that would be really cool. I'd get this look of my you know, people in the real world, cyber arms and stuff like that. And yeah, unfortunately I wasn't that good at it. So people are still talking about the Barbie doll art. Don't do that, okay? That leads to another important thing. If you do miss your target, except you missed your target. Except, yeah, I should have done more normal art. Much as I love this, I should have done more typical art. Why? Because the people picking up my game aren't me. They don't have my backgrounds. They don't have my political loves. They have what is important to them. So the other thing I go, that's a damn party doll, man. What's wrong with that, man? Um, I lost my audience at that point. Also, to be honest, again, not just the zeitgeist, but also looking at your audience again, why are they there? What are they getting out of it? Every time they pick up a game, they're adding something to how they see themselves in the world. A game isn't just, yeah, I brought this thing home. It defines a lot of things. I know people who they bring up new Euro game back and they go, hey, I've got this new Euro game. And what they're saying is the same as the guy who bought a brand new, you know, Tesla and said, hey, you look at my new car out there. If you know, I'm better than you. And you'll see that with, you know, for a while, the whole Euro game thing was like that. I went out and I got a game from, you know, Dusseldorf and you don't have it. And this means I'm smarter than you because I can get this game. Okay. What does that mean? Learn what your game is going to mean to your audience. What are they going to get out of it? How are we doing time? 30 minutes left. 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I've got about 100 more of these. Okay, so learn a lot about what your game is going to mean to your audience. Okay, And again, that means research. And it also means taking your game out and Play testing it. Okay. Most of us think of play testing as I have to fix the rules. It's not really the purpose. Play testing will fix your rules, they will find your holes. Uh, 
We just have a saying in town that we still do, which is that for every one of us, there are 10,000 of them busting our rules. And we find that out really fast these days on the internet. You know that rule on page 153? Two lines? Yeah, that breaks the whole game. Okay, somebody who's on an exploit, okay, we're screwed. Um, when you do that in video games, it moves so fast that people literally publish various books, clue books, put the ideas up on Reddit, and you're dead. Yeah, I found this exploit, now I have the most powerful character in the world. What fun is this? Okay. I would have found that, or I would find that better with playtesting. Okay. But there's another reason besides finding holes in rules, finding misspellings and all that. And that is, it allows you to find out what the game means to people. Very important. And it also allows you to find out what they're going to do with your game. Okay? Uh, anyone here ever heard the term emergent behavior? Okay, I tell the guys who play video games out there in the audience, Okay, immersive behavior is when your players use your game and they find other things to do with it, okay? Uh, my favorite immersive behavior came about, I was on the Halo team at one point as uh, more of the executive leadership than anything else. I managed like 10 dozen designers, that's crazy. Designers like herding cats that have saved two claws, it's difficult. So, somebody discovered that the warthog was indestructible. And they went, hmm. And we made the warthog indestructible because you didn't want people to use that as a technique in the game to monitor and keep gameplay with it bounce, particularly with a game that had a PvP element. You didn't want them to say, yeah, I blow up your warthog. But then people went out, they blow up, and I put a grenade underneath it. It can't blow up. What does it do? Well, the physics throw it up in the air. So the next thing you knew, there were warthog flinging groups running around the internet. There were people who were posting things on the net, like, look at this, I made it do a backflip. And it was, you know, we come to like that, there's a one piece for sale where you go across a long chasm into one of the ships, and they go like, I can cover the entire chasm and never touch the bridge. Okay, nobody on any of the team plan for that. That was like, what the heck? They're doing what? And you know, somebody only did like to like classical music. Warlocks. Fly in the air. They would get like five warlocks in a row and go, one, two, three. Look at that. It's synchronized warlock throwing. Okay. That can be a nightmare. But it can also be useful because what you just found out is that people have propensity towards games based on your game as a toy. And in the end, every game is that, it's a toy. Whether you see it or not, a game is not just an intellectual exercise, it's an intellectual toy. Okay, so if I find out that people are playing Warhawk flipping as part of you know their uh, attempts to play with my game, to do interesting things with it. Hmm, there might be a Warthog flipping game in there somewhere that I can add on to it. I can use that in some way or another. You know, um, <laughs> there are some games that like that, where you know, you'll, you'll have, for example, a uh, Dragon Age, where people would wander around, they'd you know, go into a you know, y'all's house and they'd go, oh, well, you know, I just found a ham and eggs and whatever. People started collecting recipes. And by using that information, bouncing it off of people on the internet, Reddit groups, whatever, you know, they began to have people compile, I got this, I got bacon, I did this, we put these together. Now, they have to recode a lot of things, but you know, what we just created was a treasure gathering game that was totally unexpected. And there are people who will then spend a lot of time at their Dungeon Quest line going, yeah, what the heck? I'm gonna get all the bacon in the game. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna run around for all the bacon. And what the heck? Dude, what are you doing? Two more pieces left. <laughs> uh, I, I gotta get you out of this basement, dude. This is bad. <laughs> Intervention! Okay, so 
You play chess because it not only tells you what it means to them, where you broke it, where they're going to break it, but also what emergent behavior is going to come out of their breaking it. And how much you want to either stomp down, no more warthog shooting at all, or mm, pop this warthog shooting the game. It will guide you to what your players use it for. And when you're doing your play test, don't just do a play test that is, did you like this game? Actually write out questions. You want to know what was the most fun thing? You want to know when it got stuck or they didn't understand a particular idea? You want to know when they were looking around for a clue? And this goes for particularly for role playing games, but for everything else. When were they staring at it going, well, wait a minute, here's a page 52, it says that the orcs can run backwards, but only at a speed of two, unless it's a Thursday. Okay, why was that preliminary? Well, and two, who's exploiting it by building armies of orcs that attack on Tuesday and run backwards towards you and cannot be stopped? And what they will do with that, which we've just seen an example of emergent behavior as well as work course lines going backwards and forwards. Okay. So, by the way, I'm going to give you glasses. These things can fall off. Any rate, you want to look at play tests and you want to have them write things down. And then you want to look at those play tests and you want to ask yourself, when do I see the same thoughts coming up? When do I see the same kind of behavior showing up? When do I find things that are consistently done wrong? You know, ask a dumb or two question, like, did you understand how auto fire works? How many shots did you did this which you actually have used? Okay, that's important. So don't do what I've done, which is, you know, particularly when I do video games, you blew it out of there, you didn't have to play test it, and then you could, oh man, I only had like a week more. Barkley ripped it out of my hands and ran off going, hey, we're gonna sell it now. Thanks. So get your play testing, get smart play testing. I'm gonna pause for a minute here and see if anybody has any quick questions. And then we'll move on. Anybody lost? I'm wondering. This is what I've been doing in play test right now. I'd say, okay, did anybody get lost back on page 52? Did you get lost on page 52? No. Good. Is play testing. Um, if you are play testing a game with 10 mechanics or play testing a game with two mechanics, how do you change your play testing style? Or um, do you? you don't. What you do is you ask questions. Um, most people look at play tests and just go play it and tell me you liked it. That's one question. But it doesn't tell me what you liked. It doesn't tell me what part of my game mechanic you liked. It just told me I liked it. For example, when we actually did play chess and looked at it, Cyberpunk, most people outside of that game, which is ridiculously popular, um, most people would look at the deadliness of combat. And you would go, God, if I go out there, man, my character gets shot. It's really horrible. What we discovered was that when we play tested that with a lot of military and law enforcement guys, they went, oh, thank God, I thought that game is really about what it's like out there to show up and we looked at that and we said, okay, so we got all these military guys over here and cops and you know, all these other dudes, special forces, people with jobs I can't mention because they get arrested. And then we had kind of the regular, you know, I never rolled my dice, I did. Okay. But what we realized was that it was an opportunity by looking at that mechanic set alone and saying, okay, so I'm going to tell the guy who's going, yeah, this is really complex. Yeah, it's really a bunch for you because we designed it for real military guys, and so it's realistic. It's not like, you know, kiddie stuff. So people went, wow, it's not like kiddie stuff, and then they started learning the mechanic. And then what I could learn from that is, okay, but where did it get really hard to figure that out? You know, where did auto fire get too complex? Where did I go too far down the hole where I need to back off? Still keep my military guys happy, but still create aspirational stuff in my new players. Okay. That would not have emerged without playtesting. We had to go beat on it and find out questions. 
What do you play? What do you do? What are your interests? You know, if I had not asked that, I wouldn't have known how many military guys like this. You know, as a side note, it's always fascinating me. You've got some guy sitting in a slit trench somewhere in Afghanistan getting shot at. And, you know, when he's not having to keep his head down, they're rolling dice about getting shot at. Like, dudes, really? And I've got these military guys, but yeah, I really loved it, man. We were getting shot at. But, you know, in Fallujah, it was like, this is our big break. You, Fallujah, your big break was playing a game where you could die suddenly of major bad shot wounds. Man, you guys just, they're badass. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I wouldn't even thought, I'd be like, Oh, I'm not scared, I'm not gonna rush up inside the front door. Don't kill me. <laughs> okay, so in answer to your question, you use the same models which are asked questions, get it out there, test your principles, find out whether or not your audience is looking at the same thing you're looking at, and play it from there. Okay? All right. So, time to take up more water. Okay, so we looked at some basic things. Let's look at some other critical path mistakes that I occasionally have done. Um, one of them is to know where your game is going to go moving forward, or what I call success could kill you. Okay? Um, so, we do this game. And it's insanely popular. You know, people are killing themselves to get copies of the thing. And we go, wow, this is really great. Until at one point, April rolls around and the business manager says, I just got the bill from IRS. Oh my God. And she, she's laughing about it now, but she wasn't laughing then. So success almost killed us right there. Okay, because just the bill for what we made on that besides getting Ross mad at us, um, also boiled down to, oh, we have to pay for this. And our outgo went, outgo, it made more copies. And that's a problem, because when you get successful, you've got to make more of that thing. And you have to judge how much more of that thing you're going to make. And it's a gambler's thing. You know, if I make 50 more, I'm okay. If I make 1,000 more, am I in trouble? So, you're going to want someone who can look at the numbers, and it may not be you. And that leads to the other mistake. I was lucky my wife decided after taking away two of my account managers' accounts by doing the better than he did, and getting harassed on by uh, Eric Goldberg, who was then, she became our business manager, and she has a head for figures, numbers, and likes it. So we got somebody who was pretty darn savvy at that. But if you don't have somebody who can do business to back your design, then you may get a successful game. You may die one year or less later. So look to your business side. Don't make that mistake. I lucked, but I just did it. And had our business manager not known and had a friend who had been an IRS auditor to give her some clues, um, we would have been in deeper fat. Okay, as it is, we worked out payments, we got it worked out. But we still had to judge how much more of this we were going to make, how big was it, how many things had to be ordered, how many components had to exist, um, where were we going to store it. Okay, so I want you to imagine, at one point, Telsori had a warehouse that was the size of this globe filled with pallets. Uh, now we offshore it to other places that are the sizes from full pallets. But before, we had two guys, that's what they did. They ran around, they shipped things all day. When you were in prison, I'm shipping things, I hate my job. Sorry. So, if you're making a lot of product, where are you going to put it? How much of it? How are you going to ship it? How much will you make at a given time? When am I going to stop or back off from making it? How am I going to pay for that new product along the way? These are things you all need to think about because success can kill. And also in the back of your head, how much of the money going in doesn't go to pay for the warehouse space, the pallets, the stuff I put on the pallets, the stuff I shipped in, the stuff I shipped out, how much is going into a sub-file somewhere where I can pay the IRS because I actually make you money. So don't make the big mistake 
of neglecting the business because you love your passion. Get someone who knows the business. Uh, if preferable, it does help you get someone who's in your family because at least at that point, if they're embezzling from you and they are buying you Cadillacs, at least you're going to notice it. I, I hope. But I said they work for cheap. Yeah, they work for cheap also. So you know, keep that in mind. Your business side of it is just as important. I've seen a lot of companies and have walked that edge myself where I didn't keep track of the business numbers, and that's a lot of things. Besides getting business people to keep an eye on the numbers right there, you also want a competent lawyer. Okay? I do not know how many times a competent lawyer has saved my butt from imminent disaster. And you don't think of that when you're you know, game design, okay? So I'll tell you a story. There I am, I come and tell a story, and it's quite sunny day in Berkeley. I sit down at my desk, there's a phone call, you know, I pick up the phone. I represent Todd McFarlane, and we're suing you for $13 million. What the? Beep. <laughs> so I'm looking at it going, oh my God, so $13 million. And eventually, because at this point, I was either like so tired or just going through the room here so much, or had seen lawsuits before that had not gone anywhere. I said, so, you know, tell me what you're going to sue me for, okay? He said, oh my God, I think it's over $13 million. So it turned out that um, we were doing champions in Millennium. We were doing poking up with champions, guys. And which is a whole other story I'll get to, uh, picking games you love that you may not be the best person to do. Um, but we were doing champions. Champions has had a character, a Dr. Destroyer, who's kind of a prune faced looking guy with a cobble and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And Dr. Destroyer looks a lot like Spawn. So we had them about to sue us for basically ripping off Spawn. It took a very good lawyer and a couple other people to point out that Dr. Destroyer predated Spawn by 12 years, and we could probably sue them instead. We're from the old We haven't heard anything out of for a while. 20 years. Anyway, the upshot is get people to help who are competent in the areas that you aren't. Get back up. You're not just a designer. If you want to make this work, even if you're not going to be publishing it, you're going to want somebody to look at the contract that you sign with Big Game Company because you may find you own nothing. You want somebody who's going to be able to look at the books of Big Game Company to make sure they didn't screw you over, which means they need to know something about bookkeeping. You're going to want to know something more about long-term investments because Big Game Company may have done your first game, and then when you did your expansion, say, well, I don't know, I didn't know this sounds, I mean, what do you mean? And you need to be able to look at those numbers and go, okay, how many did you put out you know, you want to be able to walk out of the warehouse and go, well, no wonder, man. It's around the size of this is pile of the ceiling with the second module. How did you think you were going to sell that? It's been a cold winter. We thought people could stay warm. No. <laughs> so these are things, again, which tie back to find allies, find people who are also wearing the Hawaiian shirts, so to speak. They will have done these things. Um, when we first started, I was doing Macton, I remember uh, Ray Gear, who's the business manager of Hero Games, taking me aside and saying, okay, so, you know, you're doing a bad box now and it costs you a million dollars, so you have a problem where you can store it, you got to assemble it, you got to pull these things together, go to a book. We did Champions, and we did Champions as a box, and it was a nightmare, so we went to a book, and surprise, surprise, it's old. That worked. Don't do the box. So if you find a copy of White Box Macton out there, it's like finding a dinosaur on your back porch. And there's a reason for that. So in sum up, because I just saw the five-minute thing, I'm going to throw things out for questions. But remember, remember the shirt you wear. Remember the products that will work. Do your research. Be willing to play test. Know what it really will cost you to do this dream game. 
and know what you're going to do if you're successful with that trade game. You avoid those disasters, you mentioned you those in mind, you'll avoid all the sleepless nights in fact that my hair is now gray and my beard is white. You'll still have it, but you know, at least you'll have hair and you'll enjoy the trip. Okay, questions? One, one or two. Yeah. The first two questions you have with this, is your game poetic based on feel of those figures or is it interesting because people like the gameplay? First and foremost, it's only a game, okay? So ask whether your game is fun, whether it has cool figures or not. Then, as you move up the scale, remember the law that I learned from Ray Career, which is that distribution says you have to have a boss. No, you didn't have to have a boss but you may have to sell distribution to other people harder on it, but make your game's cost relevant to what its gameplay is. Okay, then you can think about adding the other stuff. Unless you're selling an art game where people look, oh, man, that figure is like awesome. Because half the time, remember, it's gonna be in a box. So they're gonna nothing more. They're not gonna know you spent $10 billion on a figure. I'll take two more, and then they're going to throw me out of here. Come on, don't be shy. This is the last time you have a chance to throw things at me, verbally. Oh, come on. Check it. You and then you. When it comes to the actual piece of the game, the cost of ink versus the end sell, sale price, mm -hmm. is there a number you should go with at 20% versus the end, or 50 or? We go back and forth. Uh, Lisa, if you want to throw your two cents in here. In the days, we tried to make the retail uh, cost five to seven times the cost of making it. So if you made it for five dollars, you could sell it for twenty five. Um, as the market has gone on, it's gotten a little more expensive. I don't expect to see seven anymore. Um, but that's not a, not a bad market. Remember that. Your average U.S. distributor is going to buy your product for 60% off. So if you're selling big numbers through distribution and 40% of your retail is less than what you spend on it, you are losing money with every game. Don't do that. Okay. Yeah. And remember your intangibles, because there's not just the cost to make the figures and the spinners in the box. There's the marketing. There's a social media outreach program. Yes, uh, there, there's uh, there's uh, going to conventions to hawk your game. That costs money. It all comes together. And before you know it, you've lost you've lost money even though your game sold well because you weren't paying attention to your uh, intangible expenses. And the other part is if you did it out of love and weren't really searching that market, then you're going to take it to stores worse because you didn't sell the ones you needed to have. And you paid for those parts and those components and they're now sitting there in your garage. That could be very bad, because you can't sell them. Gentlemen in red. Yeah, so keeping with the theme of like rising from the ashes, success, <laughs> I'm curious, like, what was your lowest point where you said this is the failure of failures in your career? You um, for me, the failure of failures actually did not come up directly in the game, but actually the collapse of the game industry at 2000. I was president of Gamma, and I was watching at that point the card game explosion coming in. And distribution was going, ooh, ah, all I had to do was get in magic, wrap it up, and send it back out again. So people plunged into card games. When I started, um, there were about four collectible card games. When I left a year later, there were 70, you know, 172. Okay, and later that happened with the uh, D20 trades. So those crashed. Companies went out of business. Retailers went out of business. We lost one third of all the retailers in one year. Bam, just gone. Okay. So this is a equivalent of Toys R Us. You have a really great product, but then bam, your major outlet is gone. This has been a special episode of Listen Up, recorded at the 2019 Gamma Trade Show. 
The contents of the show are copyright our Telsorian Games. Thanks for listening, and remember, keep your sword sharp and stay safe on the streets. High tech, low life.